You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Welcome back. This is Nikayla here, and you're listening to episode 45 of Side Hustle Pro. I'm back again with another episode on the theme of how to make a living doing what you love. This week, we talk to Jocelyn Delk Adams. I first came across Jocelyn and her brand, Grand Baby Cakes, doing some innocent Facebook scrolling. I stumbled upon this video of this awesome salted caramel chocolate chip cookie recipe, and I was just mesmerized. When I tell you mouth-watering, seriously, Google this recipe. So, of course, that led me to click on her Facebook page for Grand Baby Cakes, and I just started to explore and learn about her. I would later then meet her at the 2016 Signature CEO Conference where she was a speaker, and I knew then I had to have her in the guest chair. So here's a little bit more about Jocelyn from her bio. Jocelyn is the founder, author, national television personality, and brand ambassador behind the award-winning cookbook, Grand Baby Cakes, and the food website, grandbabycakes.com, which gives her families, particularly her grandmothers, cherished generational recipes, her modern spin, while preserving the most important ingredient, tradition. Jocelyn is also today's show tastemaker and a cast member on one of the cooking channel's longest running, most popular shows, Unique Sweets. Nowadays, being a food blogger is no easy feat. So Jocelyn and I get into how you really have to be scrappy and identify what's going to set you apart. I know it's a theme that comes out in multiple of my episodes, but it's so real, y'all. Real talk, there are a lot of people who can do the thing you love. Yes, the thing that you love and want to do for a living, but they can't do it like you. And I know that most of the time it may take a while to really identify how to set yourself apart. And that's because it's so normal to you. It's, it's not special to you anymore because it's you. That's why you have to be able to poll and survey people and really ask them what it is that you do better than anyone else, what your strengths are and where it is you shine because you're so close and it's hard to really do a self-assessment sometimes. So there is something about you that you need to bring out and make sure that people know that is what sets your brand apart. And if you're having trouble with that, don't be afraid to ask. Ask your audience, ask your people who are closest to you, who know you best, really zero in on what your secret sauce is. On this episode, Jocelyn is sharing what made her start a blog in the first place, how she knew when it was time to make the leap, her approach to forming partnerships and relationships with major brands, and all of the revenue streams in her business. Before we jump into the kitchen with Jocelyn, I want to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by FreshBooks. As we speak, y'all, I just finished creating and sending out my very first invoice from Side Hustle Pro LLC. Now, if you're a regular listener to the show, you know that this is not my first time using FreshBooks ever, but it was my first time using it as a newly incorporated business owner. To make matters even better, I was able to link it up to my business bank account. So as soon as that invoice gets paid, it will go directly into my account. No waiting for a paper check. Hello. I didn't even know that capability existed until tonight. So very happy about that. This platform is super easy to use. And I did this all in like all of 10 minutes. If you want to create and send branded invoices in no time like me, FreshBooks has a special offer for my Side Hustle Pro listeners. You can get a free unrestricted 30-day trial of FreshBooks. Just go to freshbooks.com slash Side Hustle Pro and enter Side Hustle Pro in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Alrighty, now let's get into the show. Hey, so welcome to the show, Jocelyn. 
So this month, we're talking about how to make a living doing what you love. And if there's one thing I know from reading about you, it's that you love to bake and cook. It's like it's part of your (laughs) DNA, right? Part of your family. So I thought it would be more than fitting to have you in the guest chair for this month because you have done something that many others aspire to do, which is transform this passion for food into a profitable business. And we want to know all about how you did it. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Sure. Um, So I grew up in um, a suburb outside of Chicago. Chicagoans are very specific when you say (laughs) that. Yes, you guys are. Where you're from, you can't say you're from Chicago if you're not from Chicago. So um, I was born in a suburb outside of there. And really specifically, all of my family is pretty much from Mississippi. So um, we spent a lot of time there with my grandparents. And, you know, it was really kind of like a second home. And it was also um, a place where I really felt safe and secure and, and, you know, just really kind of related to it and belonged. I don't know, but like the South felt very familiar to me or just very much part of my DNA in a lot of ways. Um, So it was always exciting to go there, um, particularly spending time with my grandmother, um, who we all call Big Mama, was really kind of like the highlight. And I loved really, you know, just sharing and creating memories with her in the kitchen. And that's kind of where it all started. Um, Whenever we would go, my mother, my aunt and my big mama, we would all really kind of just get in the kitchen and just start cooking and baking. And I really was just mesmerized by the entire process and wanted to learn as much as I could. And, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm a little girl and like I had tons of questions and, you know, was probably annoying the hell out of them most of the days, but they didn't really care. They just wanted to kind of pass along this tradition to me. And I kind of accepted it with open arms. Awesome. So speaking of traditions now, how did your upbringing influence your entrepreneurial fire? Was anyone in your family an entrepreneur? Yes, my dad. My dad, he was a dentist and he owned his own practice. And um, I remember like when I was maybe like around like 10 or 11, like each summer when I was off, he would let me kind of come to his office. And sometimes I would be able to like help and work. And he would actually give me like a small little salary. But I think that it was really so impressive to kind of see my dad have his own office, all of his own patients uh, actually have staff and, and, you know, seeing my dad's name on the windows, you know, just really kind of reinforced this theme of ownership and really kind of being able to have something that was yours and that you didn't necessarily have to work for someone else. You could really have a passion for something and love something and you could really kind of direct your path, you know, whatever way you wanted to. That's awesome. And that's such a blessing. You know, not everyone has that lens. And even with that lens, though, you originally pursued a more traditional career path, right? So what was your original like career and trajectory that you were on before all of this came to be? Yeah. So, I mean, like, I guess you could say it was traditional as far as like kind of in the realm of nine to five or 10 to 10. And then for more like, you know, people who have really, really traditional careers, I'm sure this is like a lot more outside of the box, but I majored in mass media arts with a concentration in television and film. And when I graduated, I worked for the Judge Mathis show. I worked for a lot of films that came through the Chicago area. I did extras casting and like those were crazy hours because, you know, with movie sets, you would be working like, you know, 12 to 14 hour days. And then you'd have like maybe like an eight hour uh, break and then you'd have to do it all over again. You'd have to be back at work at two and then you'd maybe get home around four. It was like crazy, but it was so, so much fun. And then I kind of jumped around because I was like continuing to freelance. And then maybe like around the time I was like 25, 26, I wanted to do something a little bit more stable and have like 
benefit, <laughs> which is, I was like, uh, you know, at some point I might need to go see a doctor. Uh, so I need to like have some benefits. So I started working for a video oral history archive called the History Makers. And there I actually did a lot of television production. We would do these annual PBS specials and I wrote the scripts for them and produced them and did all the booking and worked with celebrities. And that was a really cool experience. But it was also very different because it was, like I said, more structured. You know, I worked set hours uh, and then, of course, longer hours, of course. And then I also had like a lot of responsibility because it was a nonprofit. And that was also a huge learning experience. And then from there, I worked at um, Ebony Magazine. I've had a really crazy like media career. And then I worked for an arts college where I actually was over their major event called Manifestos at Columbia College. And I basically produced a huge end of the year arts festival that basically took over the entire South loop of Chicago for the school every single summer. So it was, I mean, like I did some really incredible things before I actually was able to start my own thing. Wow. I didn't know all this. And I totally (laughs) relate to this, you know, expansive, just the windy road of media. Um, I also have a background in, in that and worked in various roles. So cool. Then what made you start blogging and baking? Because one would think, hey, Mm -hmm. these roles are kind of like more on the non-traditional, more on the artsy side. One would think, hey, I'm fulfilled, you know, I'm busy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I, um, I actually, um, like was always kind of baking here and there. Like I'd been baking like my own cakes on my own since I was like a little girl. But then I was like, when I was at Ebony, I brought in, I think we had like maybe like a potluck or something. And I brought in a pound cake and like everyone just kind of went crazy. (laughs) Like, I mean, that is like the, like that's me saying it in the most tame, tamest (laughs) words. Like everyone went crazy. Like literally a couple days later, people were like, um, can we have you bring one in? Like, we'll pay you. Can we, can you bring one in for so-and-so's birthday on Friday? So then I baked another cake and then it was like, you know, so-and-so's birthday. I want one for my birthday. And it kind of became this thing at Ebony where I was like making cakes and people were kind of calling me baby cakes, which is kind of weird. And so then after that, like, I started selling more cakes like people at work were like ordering cakes and I was literally in like a one bedroom, super small apartment in Chicago. And I was like staying up super late to bake all these cakes because I only had my small little oven. And like after a while, I was kind of burnt out by the experience of just, you know, baking for hire versus baking for just the love of it. The passion was kind of gone and, you know, I was just kind of over it. So I quit for a little bit until a friend, like, I think at this point I switched jobs and then a friend was like, you know what, you should start a blog. Like you're like, you're always baking like the most incredible stuff. And I was just like, you know, I wasn't actually sold by it at all. Like it, it took like a few months of like her kind of pushing me to even consider doing it. And then I just I started a Facebook page and just it was just going to kind of be for people, you know, who like I was like already friends with. (laughs) And then, you know, from there, I just I was like, okay, well, maybe. And so I paid like ninety nine dollars to someone on Etsy to like build my website. And that's kind of just how it started. Wow. And you bring up a great point, because I think, you know, with this being the month, the theme is, you know, making a living, doing what you love. But sometimes when we do what we love, people take over and it becomes a chore because you can no longer like call the shots, do it like you want to. No. And it was like originally, you know, baking was my zen Mm -hmm. and it was kind of the thing I just did for the enjoyment. And then as soon as it became like this very structured activity, I was like, I mean, where I literally was getting orders 
like where I was like, okay, I have like five cakes I have to bake <laughs> by tomorrow. And like, I just got home from work late and I'm just not feeling it. And, mm-hmm. and so that kind of really sort of took the joy out of it for a while. And, you know, I just had to go through that process of trying to just get back to it where I was just, you know, bringing in a cake to work. Cause I just felt like baking and just wanted to do it. And so once I was back in that vibration, then I was open to maybe challenging myself to do something different. Got it. So when did you start, you know, you're back in this vibration now, when did you start to even consider like, okay, this is, this could be a future business. You know, I've heard you talk about a moment where your boss came to you like, Hey, <laughs> So tell us about that. So so I will say that like before that moment happened, that was kind of the moment of no, like no return. It was like a wrap. But like literally, I think maybe even a year before that moment happened, I was already starting to see that maybe there was an opportunity for it to expand into something else. And I think what really prompted that was, I think it was the fact that I had secured my first brand relationship. And it happened to be like, I mean, it wasn't like a mom and pop shop. It was Pillsbury. And so like for that to be kind of like the first brand that was willing to pay you and bring you on as a blogger and also, you know, promote the work you were doing. And I was like so new to the process. And this was maybe about four to five months in after starting my blog that I actually was able to secure this relationship. And I was like, wow, you know, I was like, gosh, like I'm actually getting paid for the work I would normally be just, you know, doing on the blog anyway. Maybe there's a way to continue to grow this and see, you know, where it takes off. And so maybe I would say like a year and a half after that came that point of no return where things had really picked up for me. I had several brand relationships and I also had a literary agent at the time. And so I kind of knew that things were, you know, at the point where I either had to say, I'm willing to take a risk now and just see where I can go with this, or I'm going to just be going back and forth and not giving 100% to anything because, you know, I was, I was late to work. I was having to call off to travel for brand trips and do other things for grandbaby cakes. And at the same time, I felt like I wasn't able to give 100% to grandbaby cakes because I had a full-time job. So it was kind of, I had to make that kind of that decision to say, okay, I'm just going to go all in. Mm-hmm. And what did your boss um, say? Like, tell for those who <laughs> don't know the story. <laughs> OK, so basically, I'm pretty sure my boss was kind of like tired of me, <laughs> like, like, you know, the late and like, can I come in late? I've got this TV appearance. Um, yeah, I can't be at this work function because I'm going to be in Vegas at the Pillsbury Bake Off as media. So I kind of can't do this. And it kind of came to a point point where he literally called me in his office (laughs) and he sat me down and he's just like, um, yeah, it's time to kind of give you the ultimatum. He's like, you're not 100% here. And he's like, you know, I believe that you do have more to you than this, which, which I actually really appreciate. Like we're actually friends now. So, I mean, he kind of gave it to me straight and he said, you know, I'm, I won't be upset. I understand that there's something more that you feel you have to do or you want to do. He was like, so really just give it some thought and let me know like what it is, like what your decision is, what you want to choose. And literally for me, it was kind of just being presented with that. That made me say, you know, but why am I still here? Like it wasn't, you know, I really was just kind of, you know, teetering along and my heart wasn't there anymore. My head wasn't even there anymore. And I was just like, I came in literally the next day and was like, here's my letter of resignation. And he was like, dang, like I thought you were gonna <laughs> like, like a couple weeks or something. He literally tried to get me to stay on like past the two weeks. I was like, nah, I gotta be out. Like he, I was like, thank you for the epiphany. I gotta be out. Thanks. Uh-huh. <laughs> So, so, so funny. I just did yeah. an episode called, you know, how to side hustle without getting fired. So it's oh, so God, funny. I heard that like, like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but oh I God. want people listening to this to kind of have a sense of, okay, you're 
situation may be different than most food bloggers, right? right? First of all, how are you attracting these type of brand partnerships and securing those kind of relationships so you were in that position to leave? Yeah, I mean, I was, everything I've ever approached has just been like, 100% hustle, like give my all, like start to finish, stay up until it's done type of intensity. And so from the very beginning of starting Grand Baby Cakes, even though I wasn't, you know, savvy about like photography, that's something that I learned as I went along you know, the, even the recipe development, like I think a lot of things I originally started with were just recipes that, you know, I may have found online and just adapted. And then I started to really teach myself a lot more about that art. And, and the photography was huge too, like going everywhere and practicing and buying surfaces. And then I really started to network, like, you know, for the brands that I wanted to work with, I reached out to, for instance, like my relationship with Pillsbury started very randomly where they reached out to me and wanted to share a recipe that I had up for Kwanzaa on their Facebook page. It was just such a random email. And they were like, yeah, we'll give you credit. We'd love to put this on our Facebook page. And I was like, oh, absolutely. And that day I may have gotten like, you know, 400 more followers. And then what I did was I didn't just say thanks. And then that was it. I literally kept in contact with that person, with that PR rep. And I continue to like reach out like and share things like, hey, I used a Pillsbury product in this recipe. I just wanted to share it with you. And then they would share it on their social. But they were, I was also keeping myself in mind to them. So it's, you know, as I like I was front of mind for everything that they were thinking about, they would start to reach out. And then the next thing you know, a couple months later, they were like, hey, we're putting together a brand ambassadorship program. And we'd love to invite you to be part of that. Wow. Okay, so now you have left your job. You are (laughs) out there full time. Like what were some of the first steps you took to take Grand Baby Cakes from idea now to not just idea, side hustle to full time business? Um, definitely expanding the brand relationships. Um, that was, that was massive. Um, I also increased the number of times I was posting that was at the time because I was trying to build up more content, more traffic and, you know, and at the time I didn't have enough time to do that because I was working full time. So I pushed myself to put out more content I ended up landing my book deal. So I had that income as well. And then I was just really, really, really focused, like really hard on just like getting as much content as I could, but also creating new relationships. I went to all the blogger conferences. I made friends with everyone, like all different types of food bloggers. Like if you've got the edgy kind of cool hip crowd, I was cool with them. If you've got kind of the mommy side, more of the family food bloggers that have kind of been around for a super long time, I was homies with them. (laughs) I was homies with everyone. And when things came up like share groups or, hey, we're going to have our own little group retreats, I would always get invited to those. You know what I mean? So I was kind of pushing myself into every single arena that I could. That's awesome. And I love that there's a relationship there. I see a lot of camaraderie between the food blogger and just the space. And that's just from the outside looking in. Oh, no, there 100 percent is. You know, I'm part of like several, I would say, especially like one super core Facebook group where we share so much information. I'm sure brands would totally be surprised to even know. Like we share. (laughs) Did you get a call from like, did you get an email from this company? Hey, what do you think about rates for this? Hey, what do you guys think about what's the best time to post for this? Did you guys get this crazy email from this person? Like we share all of that information because it really is a community for us. And, you know, it's like it doesn't hurt to actually share that information because if someone, for instance, if, you know, we have bloggers that are still out there that don't command the rates they deserve or some of them still do a lot of stuff for free. And it only brings us down if we can't all say, okay, no, this is the rate. We give quality work. We demand to be paid. So it's kind of like it's important to share that information amongst us. So speaking of this community, 
that leads into my next question about knowing what your unique brand position was going to be and then who your yeah. target audience was. So I love the fact, I think you're very distinct in, you know, even how you are in photo shoots with your dresses and it, <laughs> <laughs> you have a I very distinct aura. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about that thought process. Did you map it out or did it develop organically? I think it developed organically. Um, it felt very natural for me. And I think, it, you know, so much of me is is grandbaby cakes. You know, I'm very much, it's a personal brand in a lot of ways too. And so I think that element of tradition kind of mixed with, you know, this modern fresh twist, I always kind of think in terms of that whenever I'm thinking about doing anything brand wise, whether it's new relationships with companies or whether it's design you know, or just, you know, the aesthetic in general, I always think in terms of, okay, like, does this dress fit that? Does this font fit that? You know, does this recipe fit that? Does, does my book design fit that? And I think every single element is really starting to, you know, like I see that it's really unfolding. It's all part of this beautiful book and it's just chapter after chapter and you see it kind of lending, you know, so much to what the truth of the brand is. So I, I just, I just feel like it's very organic, Got it. but also very intentional too. Yeah. And who, how did you zero in on your target audience? With my target audience, I think I sort of realized that maybe about maybe a year in because it took me some time to really figure out exactly what my voice was in the blogging world. And I think that's fine. Some people feel like they have to come in knowing exactly what they're going to do. And sometimes you you don't know. You kind of just let it unfold and see exactly where you start to gravitate. And for me, I realized that it was kind of a mix. I was getting a core group of young people who were starting to just get interested in baking because I felt like some people were like, oh, she's younger at the time when I started my blog. And I'm like, oh, she's younger and she's baking. And this is kind of cool. Like, I want to try some of these recipes. And and I kind of fostered this whole part of my brand where I'm like, I'm bringing these traditions back and I'm making this kind of hip to do now. And then the more exciting and, and also surprising aspect is that I have this older crowd too. And that's like, that's the grandmothers who are baking in the kitchen with their granddaughters and their grandsons. And they're sending me photos of like, you know, that family time in the kitchen, or they're asking me for recipes that may have been in their family that they didn't get before. So I've felt like that was exactly who I was zeroing in on, the, both of those groups. Ah, and it's funny you mentioned that because I've been bookmarking recipes of yours for like the whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a while now. And, you know, I'm getting married, so I have this registry. The first thing I put on this registry was this big old stand mixer. And yeah. my sisters, my big sisters, were like, now, when are you going to use that? You don't bake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like haters. I will, I like, will yeah. bake. I have yeah. plans, and grandbaby yeah. cakes is going to take me to those <laughs> <laughs> new heights of baking. <laughs> like, I'm going to be baking soon. Okay, Thank you don't very worry much. about it. Yeah. So, Thank you for leading us who are trying to get back into those, into the uh, tradition of baking. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something special about it. And I think there's um, a sense of accomplishment, too, when you when you make something that you're proud of. Yeah. And then, like, people actually think it's edible and delicious. Like, you know, you're like, yay, I made that. You know, it's kind of cool. Right. I want to delve deeper into the marketing piece. But before I do, I, you know, I. I would not do this justice to the people who are trying to follow your footsteps without digging deeper into that initial leap into entrepreneurship and like yeah. what everything sounds great. You had a book deal. Like what went wrong? Were you financially prepared? Like were there oh any God. hiccups? <laughs> oh my God. Of course. Um, like my, so I got a book deal, but then that book deal fell through. And so that, but like we had some negotiation issues and this is like after I quit my job and, and everything and it just, it just fell through, you know, these things sometimes happen and we couldn't come to the table and we couldn't renegotiate and we couldn't find the medium. So we just, we just left, we just parted ways. And so then my agent repitched another idea 
uh, which ended up being the book I wrote. And we had a new publisher within like a couple months. So those types of hiccups happen. I mean, I had enough money for a while, but I, I'm not going to tell you that like, you know, when they tell you have six months of income, like, oh no, I went through that money so quick. I had money saved, but like for me, I try to marry a sense of being planful with a sense of being risk takery, if that's like a term, because it's like I feel like part of what I do is is in the hustle, is in the grind. And the more security I have, the less I grind. And that just may be me. No, I totally feel that. You know what I mean? So I felt like if so me knowing that like I had to 100 percent work things out or I was going to be looking for a job really pushed me like within a year. I grew like tenfold because of that push. So, you know, yeah, of course I have money saved. But like, you know, after a while, like, you know, you have mortgage, you have bills, you have things that pop up and and you got to make moves. and, And that's exactly what I did. And speaking of, so you grew tremendously within, you know, a year and a half, as you said, where were you when you started in terms of social media? Were you, did you have a big following or did that grow along with your grind? Oh my God. Good question. I feel like I'm trying to remember the early days of my social media. I feel like when I left my job, maybe I had like 10,000 on Facebook or something (laughs) like maybe, maybe 10,000 on Pinterest, something like that. I didn't have like a massive audience. Like I tripled that in a year, I think everything. And how are you tripling this? Like I thought, yeah, I find your social media following amazing. Part of it is those addictive, delicious looking videos, but were you, were you doing videos initially? Yeah. (laughs) And But like, here's the thing, like at the time, like video wasn't the thing, Mm -hmm. you know, video is, is newer. And, and so I felt like at that time it was, you know, I was in share groups and that's basically where you have a core group of people and you kind of have a set schedule to share links that are dropped. And so I was in like a couple of those. I'm now in several of those, you know, so like that, that attention. So another blogger who may have a similar audience to mine sharing my link, you know, people are like are a they're clicking over if they really like the recipe and then B, they may go over and like my page, too. So it was just it was just naturally growing. I also had links on my website. So as my traffic grew, people would click over and like it. And then, of course, like I was working with all these brands and as they would share my content that I was making for them, then I would get followers that way as well. Got it. And were you using social media ads at this point or did that come later? I, not really. Like, to be honest, I never really used social media ads all that much. And maybe that's because, you know, at the time, like engagement was OK. Like you started to feel like this, this clinch from Facebook. And it happened like kind of slowly where you started to see engagement numbers kind of slow down and you realize that that was them trying to be like, Hey, why don't you, you know, put an ad on this or, you don't know, why don't you boost this? Like, and then all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I get the game. Like you're totally playing me now. Like I I had incredible engagement like a year ago and I had less followers and now like two people just saw my post. Like, thanks a lot, Facebook. Right. But like, you know, but then you started to see the game. But, you know, one thing you realized was, you know, when that happened, you're like, OK, I need to be more creative about making sure that people see my content instead of just pay, 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 pay. Yep. And what are some creative ways that you found have been helpful? Definitely, like as far as the content, making sure that it actually looks good, like and that's not even creative. That's just plain simple. Like, you know, with anyone as a food blogger, your photography has to be on point. There's just no way around it. You know, we eat with our eyes first and there's just no way for you to get someone to either get to your website or to even click over to your Facebook page if they're not 
enticed like visually and aesthetically from the very beginning. So that is crucial. Like the best or the top food blogs you will always notice have really incredible food photography. There's just, you just got to do it. And then, like I said, definitely the different shares and, and having people who may have similar size social media, getting your content in front of their eyes is always a great way to bring new people to your social media. It just is. Now, speaking of, so we'll transition a little from marketing to yeah. what happens after, you know, you've done a really good job marketing, which is the financial piece. And yeah. I'd like to first know, like, what are the current revenue streams in your business? Oh, my gosh, there's like a million. Um, let's <laughs> Okay. So, um, let's see. So on my website, I have, I have website advertising. So, you know, those are just ads on my website that generate just based on traffic. I'll get money for that monthly. I do some affiliate marketing with Amazon. So like products that I use and recipes, that's like gangbusters, definitely around the holidays. You know, when people are like baking up a storm, that's pretty like awesome cookbooks. I wrote my first one. So I I had an advance from that. I continue to get money from that. And, and now I'm working on my second one. So there's, there was an advance attached to that as well. Definitely brand partnerships, ambassadorships that can range from anything from recipe development to just writing to just shares on social media or photography or attending an event. So it's kind of a mix and that can just be one offs or that can just be like a year long contract or a six month long contract. Television, I do work for brands on television, local segments, but I also shoot a show on the cooking channel, speaking engagements. And then I just started like a little shop on my website too. So that I guess you could say that's like number seven. I didn't even like technically open it yet and I got some orders so now you can say that (laughs) wow (laughs) so thanks guys whoever like you know bought some stuff and I didn't even promote that it was open yet (laughs) so and you've been technically full-time now for how many years two three for three wait wait it's yeah for for like three years and I've been doing for almost five so like I've been full time longer than I haven't been. So okay. <laughs> that's, yeah. well, that's kind of cool. OK, congrats. And what did it take? What threshold did you cross before you said, OK, I'm never going back to looking for a traditional full time? Because I know there had to be days where you're like, maybe I should just get a job. Um, I had those days just early in the process of quitting my job, but mm-hmm. maybe I would say six months after that, I was like, oh yeah, I'm never getting another job or I never want to get another job. You know, you never say never, but I never want to get another job. And I think it wasn't like a financial threshold because I don't think I had like past my salary at that point from working full time. It was like an emotional and a spiritual threshold for me, a place of happiness, because I'm very much about positivity. And I just felt so excited every single day to do what I was doing and, and to actually be getting paid for it and to actually be making people happy and making myself happy and feeling such inspiration each day. And then there was also just the creativity and the variety of what I was doing. So, you know, unlike when I was baking cakes and selling them, I had like a different day every single day. I didn't know if I was going to be home testing for my book or if I was going to be, you know, on like a brand trip somewhere or flying somewhere to do TV. I mean, there was just so many opportunities coming my way. And so financially, that definitely continued to grow and grow and grow till I way surpassed what I was making before. But even before then, I was I think that it was definitely more of an emotional threshold for me. That's beautiful. I I don't know if you know, but, you know, Side Hustle Pro, we have an entrepreneur in residence. And for a year, we've been following the journey of Miko and the Dish. And, you know, yeah. And her journey to 
pretty much following in, in your footsteps of, of turning her passion into a business. And I would love to know what your biggest tips are for someone who's starting out. And, you know, it seems like you started out with a substantial following. You had a book deal and you had things that I want other people to be able to achieve before they fully step out there. So what would be your tips for them? Um, what I think is most important is that you don't necessarily like I'm not going to tell someone, OK, you need this specific number of page views because it's very subjective. And considering the blogging world now in the industry, so much of it has changed. It used to be very much focused on how many page views you were getting. But now so much of our real estate lives on, you know, the social media platform. So you could have so many followers viewing your videos on Facebook. And that also is a huge part of your brand. You know what I mean? And that also is very important to, you know, another brand that may want to work with you. That's part of your package, your engagement, you know, how many people are sharing, like, you know, your recipes or how how about your email list? You know what I mean? Maybe you have like 10,000 people following you on email and maybe only like 2000, you know, social media followers. The email is way more important than even the social media. I think there's different levels as far as like feeling comfortable. I think when you get to a point where you have so many opportunities coming to you that can financially benefit you, that you can no longer do both simultaneously. I think that's a good point to like really question whether you want to continue to do both. And I think that's kind of what it took for me. Mm -hmm. And what, goes into the decision to develop a book. So you mentioned you had a literary agent. Did you always know that you wanted to develop a cookbook or did that agent approach you? I always kind of knew in the back of my head. I, I mean, like to say that I like manifest things would just be like an understatement. Like I literally see things years in advance. I visualize them, I vision board them, and then they start to like kind of happen. And so I had already kind of had all these ideas circulating about a cookbook probably like four to five years before like two literary agents approached me within a week of each other. So it kind of like happened from not just growing my brand, but also being very distinct in my brand. And I think people need to know the difference. Like you can grow a brand and not have anything unique to say, which would not make you a great candidate to write a book. It, you've got to have something that sets you apart because there are so many cookbooks that come out every single season. What makes someone say, OK, that's a cookbook that I want to have on my shelf? You know, that's a cookbook that I want to bring into my family or I want to cook from time and time again. That that really needs to kind of be at the forefront. And then I think at the time when I had the two literary agents approach me, I think I was in a pretty solid space you know, brands were starting to know me. I was starting to get a nice following. I was starting to do local TV. So I was, I really had a presence that was being built up. So I find that when people ask me advice about, you know, how do I get a literary agent or how do I possibly get someone to check out my book proposal? The first thing I ask them is, do you have some type of platform? And it doesn't necessarily just mean followers or social media. It also means, are you exposed anywhere? You know, do you have maybe, um, are you cooked? Like, are you teaching cooking classes and you have like a large following of people who come regularly to your classes to learn from you? Um, Are you writing for publications? You know, I was doing other work for other publications too. Um, And do you have a social media following and people who read your blog on a regular basis? It's kind of a mix of all of it. I love that you say that. You know, what I hear from you is like, you have to be scrappy. Like there's so many people who can cook in the world, who can bake. Um, There's so many. It's kind of like, it's kind of like how many people can walk like tons. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it doesn't mean that like, you know, because you can do something that so many other people can do, you know, you've got to figure out what separates you. Oh, yeah. And personality is a huge part of that. So it is true to bring that out. Now, before we get into the lightning round, I would love to know 
What was the most surprising part and aspect of entrepreneurship? Um, definitely for me, it's it's seeing how my career has evolved. When I started, I specifically was like very in tune with the blogging aspect of it and just seeing how like so much grandbaby cakes has transitioned into so many other things like the books, the television opportunities that have come my way and the speaking. And it's just really kind of been so surprising and I couldn't have scripted it. You know, it started with an idea. It started with really just like a passion. Like you said, it just, it started with something that I love to do. And, you know, you may have an idea in mind, but don't be afraid to just let it unfold as it, as it does. You know, like if you have a talent for something, explore it. Don't be afraid, like say yes to a bunch of stuff and then you'll start to see what it is you really want to do. Love it. All right. So we're going to jump into the lightning round. You know, the deal, just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. So number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? I would actually like I read. Uh, well, OK, I love to listen to <laughs> Gary V. Vandercheck. Um, I think it's Vander Vanderchuk. Vanderchuk. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's very inspirational. He also has a very like he is like he's like a master at, at like entrepreneurship and he really understands like where media is going. And so I find him very exciting to listen to. I, I just love like the information that he spouts and he basically he'll tell you everything that he thinks is happening, where things are moving, where you should be moving, especially if you're in this kind of digital space career wise. I, I just I love like I listen to him all the time. Yes, we are big fans of Gary Vee here as uh, a pro. And a lot of guests mention him. Yeah, he oh, is really? the bomb. Oh my God, uh -huh. okay. Yep. Yeah, like, I just, I listen to him a lot because, you know, just even more recently, like with me doing like the television stuff, I've started to veer more into video as well, like on the digital side to really kind of be on both ends. Cool. So number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? I guess that kind of might overlap. <laughs> I, I know, right? Okay. So, um, oh goodness. Okay. So I love the book. I think it's the one thing because I am a Gemini. So I'm like all over the place. It's like, it's, it's just part of my DNA. And I find myself sometimes trying to prioritize like a million different things. And this book was like so instrumental in making me kind of like par down that list and figure out exactly, okay, what is like the one thing that I need to really focus on that's going to push me like to the next level, not the 10 things, because like, it's not 10 things that are going to do it. It's mm -hmm. like, it's more like maybe like, you know, one or two major things. If I really put all of my resources into it, that would really make a difference. And, and then also I read, okay, I know this is another book, but I read you're a badass at the beginning of the year. Yes. And I it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I loved it. Oh my God. I loved it. So number three, who inspires you and why? Um, I am inspired one by my grandmother I'm inspired by her because of her creativity and her ability to not only create these recipes, a lot of which have been passed down throughout my family, but like how much love goes into every single thing that she does. And I really want to make sure that as I'm running my business, that I'm first thinking kind of with that mindset and putting so much of my heart into it, because I felt like so far in my career that has majorly paid, like paid off for me. And then, I mean, like my friend Carla Hall, Sonny Anderson. And I mean, like, of course, like the peak, like, you know, Ina Garden, like Martha Stewart. I mean, that is where I'm aiming to be. Mm -hmm. And you are well on your way, sister. <laughs> I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I'm that vibration, girl. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Number four, what's a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Um, The fact that I 
am very anal and organized um, to a T. Like I'm very specific about to-do lists every morning. Like I cross things off. Like I'm very anal about that. I think that that type of organization from everything in like a million different like Google Docs and pages <laughs> Like has really helped me because I have like so many balls in the air and and that has really helped me like stay on top of everything. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm anal too. (laughs) And finally, number five, what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? There is no worry. Worry doesn't do a thing. I realized like whether I was worrying or not worrying, it didn't matter. It didn't change. Like it didn't change anything. So when I got over the fact that like I could control nothing, like I couldn't even control whether I would be working a nine to five or not. At any point in time, I could have gotten fired any point in time I could have gotten laid off. And so the security that we place in things like jobs isn't really that secure. So like I realized that I needed to put more trust in me than anybody else. And if I put that sort of trust that I had in some job in me and my abilities and and my talents and my skill and worked my butt off, I could put that same type of security within myself. Amen. I love that. All right. So before we wrap, what's the best way that we can connect with you after this episode? Sure. Um, so website, uh, grandbabycakes.com or grandbaby-cakes.com. Facebook handle is grandbabycakes. Instagram, grandbabycakes. Pinterest, grandbabycakes. Twitter, Grandbaby Cake, even though I just (laughs) finally, I finally, like after like a two year battle um, with my trademark, I finally got it. And so, yay. So like that should be Grandbaby Cake soon. So, but everything is pretty much Grandbaby Cakes. Awesome. Alrighty. Well, Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair today. It was awesome having you. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Alrighty, guys. So there you have it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the side hustle pro Facebook community. Go to side hustle forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe rate and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.